three, two, one. Go live. Go for it. How do we know we're live? Because we're live. But how do you know? Because I know. And now people are listening to us and they're saying, why are they wondering if they're live or not? <laughs> well, I hope we're live. I'm Pastor Rob Harbin. Welcome to Faith Lutheran Church and Preschool's uh, Sunday morning roundtable Bible discussion with the pastor. I am joined by... Pa- pastor Clayton Sellers. My... my uh, 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 partner in uh, Bible class today, who's actually going to be leading the discussion as we get into the antagonism Mm -hmm. uh, between King Saul and King David, because technically speaking, they're both kings. Right, they're both. At the same time, right? Exactly. Even though one is on his way out and the other is on his rise to power. Um, Every Sunday morning at 930, we offer the roundtable Bible discussion with the pastors. We hope you'll continue to join us. Uh, Just before I forget, uh, there is no in-person worship for the 11 o'clock service today. In case Mm -hmm. you did not get the email or you did not get the text, uh, the residential streets are still literally ice-packed here in Collierville, and our uh, parking lot is is covered, and the the driveways are, in some cases, still impassable. Mm -hmm. So we decided it was in everyone's best interest for safety purposes that everyone just stay home. So... Uh, You can join us for a live stream service at 11 o'clock. We hope you'll do that. Today, you need to open your Bibles to 1 Samuel uh, chapter 18 and following is where we will be uh, for our our discussion as we we talk again about the antagonism between uh, Pastor Clayton and Pastor Rob. (laughs) There's no antagonism. No. no No. What a slip. Oh, boy, that's just <laughs> terrible. Anyhow, anywho, uh, the antagonism between King Saul and King David. Um, and so if you do have questions, we encourage you to text the pastors. I want to remind you, you can do that if you've got our numbers. Uh, text us. Pastor Clayton is following the Facebook uh, s- stream uh, on his computer, so he can see those comments as well. We're We're kind of shorthanded this morning, so... Be bold and ask your questions. It's always helpful. Don't think that it's uh, uh, no question is a dumb question. It can really enhance the conversation. Mm-hmm. So let's begin with a word of prayer, and then we're going to dive in. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise that um, you anointed King David to be the greatest monarch in Israel's history, pointing us to the greater King of kings and Lord of lords of all people, your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, in David's life, uh, whether it be through uh, his trials and tribulations or his victories, you pointed us in a bold and powerful way uh, to your Son, Jesus. Help us to continue to see Christ uh, in, in David's attitude and in his life Uh, And, dear Lord, bless our conversation today that the people of God here at Faith Lutheran and our extended faith family would be edified uh, and that we would uh, be encouraged. All of this we pray in Jesus' matchless name. Amen. Amen. So, Pastor Clayton, get us started this morning. So, we're going to do a little bit of review, a little bit of looking ahead, you know, because as as we've laid out this, this, this whole series, we've instead of kind of working a chapter by chapter sort of a thing, we're doing sort of this thematic sort of a a thing. So, you know, how David relates to other things and how other parts play into this. Like how does David and the tabernacle and David and the temple, how does God interact with that? Or David and Jonathan or David and Solomon. Uh, Today's topic or today's theme is David and Saul. And there have been a, a few times where David and Saul have, have interacted with one another in the lead up to this, but I wanted to get the the broad view from uh, from Genesis or from Genesis from First Samuel sixteen all the way to First Samuel thirty one, but to do it in a um, in this sort of parallel lives to see how they to see how they they line up as um, as uh, as uh, what's the word I'm looking for here. Um, I, I want to say objects, but that's not the right opposites. word. Opposites. As, as opposites, as examples of righteousness, as examples of unrighteousness. Um, and, to, and to see how those, those two things play out at the same time. And, and you have quite the diagram here. I have here. quite the diagram here. And I think you do that because, uh, folks, the, the black line will be tracing King Saul. Mm-hmm. 
And the blue line will be tracing King, King David. David. Right. And you will notice right away the symbolic direction that those lines go. Yes, exactly. Saul is headed downward. Right. David is headed upward. And you have this chiastic. Yep. Uh, that's a theological term, but yeah. it, it, it shows up all well, over yeah. the scriptures. It really does. It shows up in, in Hebrew poetry. Mm -hmm. It shows up in Hebrew prophecy. Right. It shows up in the life stories of all the characters throughout right. scripture. But you have this chiastic event mm -hmm. that takes place between David and Saul. Exactly. And I, I was, as I was putting this together and I, as I was thinking about it, um, sometimes, sometimes something that falls together like this can almost seem made up or contrived. Um, but I, it, we're not denying the historicity of any of this, right? The, these things happened. Now, how they've been laid out by 1 Samuel, written by an author inspired by the Holy Spirit to be that Holy Spirit-inspired, inerrant Word of God is absolutely true. But there's some, there can be some style here as well to, to drive home these points, right? Because this, the, the Bible is, is pointing us to salvation. It's pointing us to Jesus Christ. It, it's pointing us to, to a righteousness in God. And so the author's going to be doing that, not so much political science, not so much leadership principles, though there are those things that can be pulled out, but to drive us to see salvation through faith in God alone and to set up these, these patterns. And so this is a, a, a chiastic structure, as you pointed out, that, that gets brought out in a lot of different ways and in a lot of different uh, parts of literature to set up these opposite characters to, to learn lessons from both of them, those, those positive lessons and those negative lessons. Yeah. Um, and so that's what we're going to do today. And it's going to, as we lead up to it, we're going to center here at the end of 1 Samuel 23 and the beginning of 1 Samuel 24. This is where these things are going to kind of come to a head. So you're going to have to, you're going to have to pay close attention today. It's Bible study. So we will be in 1 Samuel but we will be moving around a lot in mm -hmm. 1 Samuel. Yeah. So, again, have your Bibles and your, and your fingers uh, uh, warmed up and ready yeah. to go. So, again, just by, just by way of reminder, you'll remember yeah. that Yahweh rejects Saul. And so Yahweh has rejected Saul because Saul has rejected the Word of God. So, so God said to, to Saul, and we've covered this, so we'll do it very briefly. Uh, I'm, uh, it's time to, for me to take out my divine vengeance on the people of the, the tribe of Amalek, the Amalekites. Completely destroy them. Saul doesn't. He saves the best sheep. He saves the prettiest women. And he saves the king for himself, having rejected the word of God. There was a time where God had told Saul to go and wait for Samuel. And Samuel will come and offer the sacrifices before a battle. Uh, Samuel takes too long, according to Saul, and Saul usurps that office and that authority of the priesthood and offers these sacrifices, again, rejecting God's word. Um, and so Saul is rejected by Yahweh um, in, that, in that because the, the unforgivable sin is, the, uh, is the, the blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, the rejection of the Holy Spirit, and Saul continually is going to fall into this. Okay. That parallels then in the very next chapter that Yahweh... I'm going to draw a line. Please do. Please do. Uh, that Yahweh has Samuel anoint David, who's the youngest, who's the smallest, who's the most forgotten of all of Jesse's sons, right? So as soon as Saul is rejected and he's a head taller, Yahweh's going to pick the smallest, the most forgotten of Jesse's sons and anoint him to be the, the new king. And, and, and on the one hand, it, it's almost humorous. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can you can see God's sense of humor in all of this, yeah. in not picking the biggest, the tallest, the baddest, the most good looking, right. and picking the smallest. Uh, but this is His modus operandi. Right. God is continually choosing the lesser things, mm -hmm. the weaker things, the smaller things. Exactly. The scandal, and it's scandalous. It, it really is scandalous. And this, so this is gonna this is gonna play out again as. Um, Saul is going to cower before Goliath, right? So the, the Israelites are, are lined up across the, the valley of Elah uh, against the Philistines, and Goliath for 40 days comes out and says, why are, you know, come and, come and defeat me, and, and all of Israel, and all of, and Saul the king, uh, who's, who's Israel's giant, because he's a head taller than everybody, uh, are, is cowering. But as we talked about for the last two Sundays, David is going to trust in Yahweh, and he's going to go rushing into battle. Uh, not for he trusts. He trusts. Uh, he's going to trust in Yahweh. He's going to trust in, in the Lord of hosts. He's going to trust that the battle, as, 
as Yahweh delivered David from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear, he's going to deliver him from the, the paw of, of Goliath. So again, we're, we're seeing these, 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 this chiastic, these opposites here. After that, uh, Saul is going to be jealous of David. So this is that, that famous song in um, this, the, the famous song of, of, of the women in, in 1 Samuel 18. Saul has struck down his thousands, David his ten thousands. Um, which one of, my, one, of the, one of the professors at the seminary twisted it in talk, talking about uh, people falling away from the faith. It says, heresy has claimed its thousands, boredom has claimed its ten thousands. Wow. Um, which is a, kind of a... a uh, you know, there, there's a lot of no. There, there is a lot to that. Yeah. It's just the uh, the uh, the tendency to not move. Right, mm-hmm. things not in motion tend to not go into right. motion. Right? right, and so complacency. Com- that complacency and, and the you know giving up the vigor um, and the uh, the vigor and the energy that is in the Christian faith and in theology and, and trusting these things. So that was a, a, an interesting uh, twist that he put on it. Um, but so. Saul is jealous of David, but David is going to receive all the things of Saul. So Saul is going to give David his daughter, Michael. Saul is going to uh, give to David his armor. Saul is going to give the leadership of the army to David. And so Saul is, Saul is jealous of David, but Saul is still giving David all of these things. And so we see this, again, these, these God, parallels. God at work. God. It, it, it's reminiscent of the... Israelites coming out of Egypt, right. where Pharaoh and uh, the people of Egypt are mean-spirited mm-hmm. towards the Israelites. They, they, they hate them. Right. They kill them. Mm-hmm. They purge uh, the, the young boys, yep. uh, or they, they, they try to purge the, the, the baby boys yeah. from among the people of Israel. And yet on their way out of Egypt, the Egyptians give all their gold right. and all their jewelry yeah. to the Israelites. Exactly. That's exactly it. And for more on Exodus, join us on Wednesdays for our midweek Clinton series as we study the book of Exodus. If we, ha- <laughs> if we could just have, if we have these shiny dings on our right. teeth at this point. Ding! <laughs> but we are talking about the book of Exodus yeah. on Wednesdays in Lent. Um, and then, uh, relate, so after this, then, we, we're, we're, things are really starting to come to a head. It's getting intense. It's, get, it's going to get really intense, and it's going to get really uncomfortable. Um, as Saul tries to kill David. Uh, there's going to be multiple times where, um, uh, in, in 1 Samuel 19, it's, the scriptures say uh, that Saul tries to pin him to the wall with his spear, which is just, it's such an evocative sort of an image. Like, not just kill him, not just throw his spear at him, but throw his spear so hard through David, who's so close that it would go through him, carry him, and pin him to a wall. That's hatred. That's that's a hatred. That's an anger. That's a uh, just a just a, a madness there. Um, but David is going to play the he's going to play the lyre, a, a type of a, a type of a harp, and that that music is going to um, calm Saul's spirit. But uh, this is also related to what you were talking about this morning in our. In the, in the sermon at the start of this sermon series, that David is going to de-escalate these things. Um, and so, I, so I, I don't know if you want to add anything yeah, about that. Yeah, I mean, we, that. what we were talking about uh, in today's sermon is one of the destructive patterns in relationships is that we escalate, mm-hmm. we one-up, or we um, um, try to get back at yeah. people. So yeah. if somebody does something to us, we do something to them, then they do something to us, right. and this escalation continues Mm -hmm. happens all the time in in sibling relationships marriages uh happens in the workplace happens in churches uh where where whole congregations become split apart because Mm -hmm. someone has upped the ante just uh uh, one time too many yeah and and uh here we have saul uh more or less escalating his Mm -hmm. intense jealousy and he's going after David, and at no point in the entire narrative of David and Saul, at no point does David um, uh, pay Saul back mm-hmm. in kind. At no point does David try to uh, uh, escalate the situation. In fact, David does everything to de-escalate, yeah. so he backs off. Uh, so instead of meeting Saul's attempt to kill him with um, with uh, um, vitriol, mm-hmm. he 
plays the lyre for him. Right. Uh, and we're going to see some other situations uh, where David actually has the opportunity mm-hmm, mm-hmm. to kill Saul uh, on two separate occasions. Right. David has an opportunity to kill him, mm-hmm. and he backs away. He yep. doesn't. He does not want to escalate. Yeah. So, so let, let's turn. So we're here now at our at our middle. Um, and again, so just to this is all stuff we've been covering and talking about, but we wanted to put it, you know, in context with each other. And, and we could put you know chapter markers here if we really wanted to. But I think you get the idea. Of, of how these things are playing out, the righteous and the unrighteous, those who, who trust in themselves and those who trust in Yahweh, and what those, what those lives look like and what their behavior looks like. All right, so let's so get let's, into the text. Yeah, so let's look at the text here. So we're going to be in, in 1 Samuel 23, verse 15. And so all of this has you know, been leading up to, up to where we are now in 1 Samuel 23, 15. Uh, so I'll, I'll just start reading and we'll, we'll go from there. David saw that Saul had come out to seek his life. David was in the wilderness of Ziph at Horish, and Jonathan, Saul's son, rose and went to David at Horish and strengthened his hand in God. And he said to him, Do not fear the hand of Saul. Do not fear the hand of Saul, my father. Do not fear, for the hand of Saul, my father, shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel, and I shall be next to you. Saul, my father, also knows this. And the two of them made a covenant before the Lord. David remained at Horish, and Jonathan went home. Then the Ziphites went up to Saul at Gib- Gibeah, uh, saying, Is not David hiding among us in the strongholds at Horish, on the hill of Hakilah, which is south of uh, Jeshimon? Now come down, O king, according to all your heart's desires to come down. And our part shall be to surrender him into the king's hand. And Saul said, May you be blessed by the Lord, for you have had compassion on me. Go, make yet more sure. Know and see the place where his foot is, and who has seen him there. For it is told me that he is very cunning. See, therefore, and take note of all the lurking places where he hides, and come back to me with sure information. Then I will go with you. And if he is in the land, I will search him out among all the thousands of Judah. And they arose and went to Ziph ahead of Saul. Excuse me. Now David and his men were in the wilderness of Maon uh, in the Arabah to the south of Jeshimon. And Saul and his men went to seek him. And David was told. So he went down to the rock and lived in the wilderness of Maon. And when Saul heard that he pursued after David in the wilderness, and when Saul heard that, he pursued David in the wilderness of Maon. Saul went on one side of the mountain, and David and his men went on the other side of the mountain. And David was hurrying to get away from Saul. And Saul and his men were closing in on David and his men to capture them. A messenger came to Saul, saying, Hurry and come, for the Philistines have made a raid against the land. So Saul returned from pursuing after David and went against the Philistines. Therefore the place was called the Rock of Escape. And David went up from there and lived in the strongholds of En Gedi. All right. So, big text there. Don't get too lost in the in the name and the geography of that, right? So this is just uh, for those for those who know the geography. You know those first readers of First Samuel uh, who uh, who are reading it. This is that the the geography being the the fifth gospel, as we've talked about. The these places are, are known places, and they're found, and, and it puts it in a in a concrete location. So we don't need to be too worried about this this location. Except that, except that Saul is pursuing David across this whole vast wilderness in this, in this vast, um, rocky, hilly, mountainous, cavernous area. And so it, it's not an easy task, uh, but is, is in fact requiring so much effort of Saul to do this and so much manpower to do this, to feed this army that he has with him, to, to rely on so many different contacts and to, to do all this. And so it points to this great effort of, as, that Saul is putting forward to uh, pursue after David, um, which just kind of, again, shows... It really goes back, uh, it really goes back to the touchstone that Yahweh has rejected Saul. And mm-hmm. you really, uh, you know, on the one hand, uh, is, is Saul acting this way because Yahweh rejected him? Mm-hmm. Or uh, is this just the outflow of Saul's unfaithfulness? Right. Uh, and I think it is the latter mm-hmm. that um, 
God had rejected Saul because he knew Saul's heart, mm -hmm. and, and Saul is now pursuing, yeah, right? Saul is pursuing David. Pursues. Yeah. And he, he takes all these resources, so much so, folks, I don't know if you noticed, but who attacks? The, the Philistines. They see uh -huh. that the king is not doing what the king should be doing. Yeah. The king is off chasing David and his men. Mm -hmm. And because Saul is not be, doing you know, the king, the kingly being the things. King, doing the kingly thing, yeah. the Philistines attack the, right. the land again. Right. And so we see, um, um, and so we, again, we see how, how Saul has lost sight of this. Now, interestingly, David's going to fall into a similar, a, a similar he sin. He is with Bathsheba. With Bathsheba. And so we, but but the, it's the response to those that, that's going to be the difference. And we talked about Bathsheba mm -hmm. back in, in December in, uh, in Advent about how, you know, and we've talked about this before, David is a man after God's own heart, and he's going to repent of his sins, and he's going to do all of these things. Now, real, real quick, before we, before we look at, what, at David, we've laid out so much sort of this narrative and, and kind of these historical events and these character studies. And, and I, don't, I don't know about you, Pastor Rob, um, and I've mentioned this before. When, when I always get stuck reading the text and reading history as if these things are sort of devoid of emotion. You know, and like in, in my mind, I, I, I sometimes turn these characters as they're talking into um, feelingless automatons. And so they're just, you know, kind of these robot voices talking to each other. Um, but we, we, I, I, I often lose sight. And maybe you're, maybe you I don't. think you've watched too many Terminator movies. Maybe. But I, I lose sight of the fact that in, you know, in four, in four pages, well, more than four pages, but you get the idea here, in eight pages of the scriptures, from here to here is almost six years or seven years. And how much, how much life and how much happens are in six or seven years? How much, you know, wrestling in the heart happens? Uh, how much... And even just what, what is that emotional response? Yeah, okay, so uh, folks, uh, do the exercise yourself. Over the course of the last six or seven years of your life, how many ups and downs have you had? Mm -hmm. What have those emotions been like? Mm -hmm. Have you had any struggles over the course of the last six or seven years that have taken you perhaps to the brink of depression or to the high points of, of, of joy and, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and happiness. Yeah. Um, you know, that's what we've covered basically in, in just a few pages right. of 1 Samuel. Yeah. And so just to, uh, and again, to, to kind of highlight this and put this into perspective, open your Bibles to Psalm 54. Psalm 54. Yeah. Give everybody a, a second to open to Psalm 54. And Pastor Rob, when you get there, will you read the, the title of Psalm 54 for right, us, I'm, please? I'm reading from the uh, 84 NIV, and um, Pastor Clayton has been reading from the ESV, or the English Standard Version. Mm -hmm. But the, uh, the title for Psalm 54 reads, For the director of music with stringed instruments, mm -hmm. a mascal of David, when the Ziphites had gone to Saul and said... Is not David hiding among us? So we actually have yeah. in Scripture a signpost. Yes. This is really cool. It's a right. mile marker. Mm -hmm. uh, Psalm 54 is what David writes right after what we just read. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so and, and we're, and we're going to read it because there's some, there's some important things for us to, to take out of so this. So when you're reading your Bibles, and you, if you ever have a study Bible, they usually, has, they usually have cross-references mm -hmm. or study notes. Uh, my Bible doesn't. It's just a, it's just a straight-up uh, bare-bones Bible. Yep. Pastor Clayton's has a study Bible. Psalm 54, the Psalms that David writes mm -hmm. usually get connected in those cross-references for you to read. Yeah. So if you do want to get some of the emotion of what's going on, that's how you that's how you find those sure. texts. Right. And a, a guide for our own emotionality in in our own ups and downs, right? So it's um it, it's not to for us to be emotionless. It's not for us to be without a, a a reaction in our heart and in our in our you know kind of in our spirit or in our soul. But we want to do so in a in a faithful way. And and King David over and over is going to give us that way. So let's read Psalm 54 okay. um, and, and see how David's going to respond to all of these things that have been happening to him. 
So 54 verse 1. O God, save me by your name and vindicate me by your might. O God, hear my prayer. Give ear to the words of my mouth. For strangers have risen against me. Ruthless men seek my life. They do not set God before themselves. Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is the upholder of my life. He will return the evil to my enemies and your faithfulness put an end to them. With a free will offering, I will sacrifice to you. I will give thanks to your name, O Lord, for it is good. For he has delivered me from every trouble, and my eye has looked in triumph on my enemies. Hmm. All right. So, Pastor Rob, as we were reading through that, what was um, what stood out to you there? Just kind of as 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 an understanding of David, kind of giving voice to that emotion of of what's going on. Uh, I he, clearly David is calling out to the one who can help him. Yeah. Uh, he is not going to the Pharaoh of Egypt for mm-hmm. help. Mm-hmm. He's not going to the king of um, the next door um, uh, arch, arch right. enemies for help. He, mm-hmm. He's going straight to God for help. Yeah. Um, and he, it's interesting that he mentions, and again, this is confirmation of what we've already talked about in verse 3, strangers. Mm-hmm. Are attacking me. Mm-hmm. Ruthless men seek my life. Men without regard for God. Yeah. Again, confirmation of a faithless Saul. Yep. Uh, who's only in it for himself. But that David would recognize Saul as a stranger. Mm-hmm. Um, right. To, to be cut off from the people mm-hmm. of God. To, to no longer be part of that family of that tribe. Being, being brought in together in that way. Uh, but you also have mm-hmm. King David literally asking God to bring down punishment on the evildoers. Yeah, he, yeah. But again, this is that part of that that escalation or that de-escalation. It, David's not saying, "God, give me your blessing to do these things," right. but God, I'm going to trust in your hands to do this. I'm going to give the you know, vengeance is mine, right. saith the vengeance. Lord. There is nothing that God does that isn't a righteous act. Correct. And yes. so we have to always, we always approach uh, God from that presupposition mm-hmm. that all his decisions and all his acts are righteous yeah. in their judgments. Mm-hmm. And so if he strikes someone down, he is righteous for doing that. Correct. Yes. Um, and and uh, ultimately, that's, aren't you glad he doesn't still do do it that way. Right. <laughs> you know, that's why uh, Jesus Christ suffered on the cross mm-hmm. for us uh, so that we would not be um, smitten. Right, right. Yeah, right. He was, he was uh, stricken, smitten, and afflicted right. kind of on, you know, on our behalf. By his stripes, we are healed. Um, the theme for our Sunday. Did, so is, there something, is there something else that you were looking for? I think, and just, I, I think it's, it's important to, to know that even in the midst of the turmoil and the tumult and the I, I'm I mean if somebody's been pursuing me for six years and and all of this is happening and they're dedicating all of these resources I got to imagine there's some kind of sense of despair there's some sense of you know kind of woe is me and yet David in the midst of all of that is turning back to God he's not abandoning his confession He's not abandoning his faith. He's not abandoning the no, power he, of God. No, he makes a he makes a statement of confession yeah. in verse six, mm-hmm. and this is I, you know we talked about this um, last last mm-hmm. Sunday, if mm-hmm. I remember correctly, when we were talking about David and Goliath in the face of rejection. If you know that the battle is God's battle, make a faith confession or a mm-hmm. uh, a faith statement. Yeah. David is doing that in this psalm, verse six. I will sacrifice a free will offering to you. I will praise your name, O Lord, for it is good. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting in verse 7, oh, yeah. he yeah, yeah. has, this is a, a reminiscent of what we call in uh, theological terms, a prophetic perfect. Mm-hmm. Uh, what is a prophetic perfect? I think, that's, I think this is relevant. Yeah, yeah, no, it is. Uh, it's absolutely uh, relevant. A, a pro- in, in the Old Testament, <clears throat> you may not notice this. Sometimes it, it, it sneaks through when you're mm-hmm. not reading uh, when you're not careful, I should say, um, sometimes the prophet will talk about things as if they are already completed. Mm-hmm. The prophet, like Isaiah, does this a lot. Yep. Isaiah is a classic example of what we call a prophetic perfect. And so a prophet 
will see events as they have already been accomplished. Yeah. And he will talk about them in the past tense. Mm -hmm. And you see David doing that here in verse 7. Look yep. at, and this is really important it when is, you're reading. Because, because remember. In, it hasn't you know, happened it yet. It hasn't yet. In first, in first Samuel 20, at the end of 1 Samuel 23, David doesn't know what's going on. Saul's on the other side of the mountain. Saul, David doesn't know that the Philistines are going to come and, and Saul's going to be distracted. As far as David knows, he's going to get put into the hands of Saul and he's going to be executed at the hands of Saul. And yet, he says, for he has delivered me from every trouble. Yeah? And so this is that, that prophetic perfect. The, um, but, and we, we know this as well in faith, right? Has Christ defeated death? Is death now defeated? Yeah, it is now defeated. Do, now, do we have the, the fullness of Christ's victory? No, we still die. We, we still die. But death has been defeated. And so we know that we have this eternal victory. Uh, has, you know, we, we, can, we can pull all of these different images, especially from the book of Revelation and uh, of, of, you know, the, the every, every, there will be no weeping, there will be no more tears, there will be no more sorrow and no more sin. Um, and so there's this, we, we refer to this as the, the now and the not yet. Right. Does David now have the vindication of God? Yes. Yes, he does. And it's that ultimate vindication and faith in the Messiah who is to come. That's the ultimate vindication. However, God, however it shakes out in this life, the ultimate vindication is on the cross and out of the tomb on the last so, day. So I guess, I guess it comes down to this. What are the enemies that pursue Christians mm -hmm. and the church today? Mm -hmm. How do we react or respond to that pursuit? Yeah. Um, you know, we have, we, we talk about this often enough. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, the way that Christian liberties have mm -hmm. been um, curtailed somewhat mm -hmm. uh, in our nation today. How is the church going to respond to that? Um, will we continue to praise God in the midst of our trials and mm -hmm. tribulations? You know, that is important. Uh, I remember going to the hospital. Uh, ye this was years ago in my last congregation. Lady, very sweet lady, uh, she was dying. Mm -hmm. And I asked her how she felt, mm. you know, how she was feeling in that moment. Mm -hmm. As she was laying there in the hospital, and they had, they had just told her like a few days earlier that, she, you know, she just had a very short time to mm -hmm. live. And you know, I kid you not, this woman had this huge beam on her mm -hmm. face. Mm -hmm. She smiled and she said, and I quote, I am excited. Mm -hmm. I finally get to see my Savior. This mm -hmm. was her response yeah, yeah. to them telling her mm -hmm. that she was dying and yeah. that she had a very short time. In fact, it was just days. Mm -hmm. Uh, I did her funeral, and, mm -hmm. and I, I shared those oh, words yeah. with her. Um, or she's, I shared her words with the congregation yeah. at her funeral. And uh, it, it, it is a, an amazing response mm -hmm. in the face of death. Now, yeah. our, I, I know you may feel a little heavy-hearted now. Mm -hmm. Wow, I don't know if I could do that. I don't know if I could do that either, um, but she did. Mm -hmm. She was a faith-filled woman. Uh, she was dying younger than she she should have, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Uh, but she was she was excited. She mm. wanted to be with her Savior. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, yeah. you know, right. how what pursues us? Yeah. Death pursues us. Right. Not just the world. Uh, how are we going to respond mm -hmm. when these troubles and trials yeah. and tribulations come to us? Yeah. And so I want to we want to do this last thing, and then we'll we'll fill in the other half here. David's response is that the this this thing here is going to drive us to to always trust in God. We've been we've been saying this before. David does it against Goliath, but but the we're our call is to trust in God no matter what the situation is. Even if you're being pursued by you know unrighteous people who are trying to take away what God has given to you, trust in God above all else. Know that he's vindicated you. Know that he has delivered you from every trouble through the through the Messiah who is his son Jesus Christ. So I encourage you to look, read through the Psalms, especially, you know, Psalm 54. But part I, think of our I, I also, before yeah. you, you transition, just remember, again, Pastor Clayton pointed out, this was a six, seven, six, seven years of, of events. Mm -hmm. uh, this did not just clear up quickly right. for David. Right. This was an ongoing. Well, yeah, and, and it's going to continue ongoing, right? It's going to continue for a number of years still more. Probably over 10 years yeah. worth of heartache. Yeah is what's going to happen here.
Um, and so in the midst of it, continually turning back to that trust in God. Okay. All right. Sound good? All right. So now let's pick up. Uh, so we see David has this ultimate trust in God and ultimate trust in Yahweh that Yahweh will vindicate him, that God's going to ha- take the vengeance and do all of these things. So now we pick up in Saul, 1 Samuel 24. 24. When Saul returned from following the Philistines, he was told, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men in front of the wild goat's rocks. That's my favorite place there. Um, And he came to the sheepfolds by the way where there was a cave. And Saul went in to relieve himself. Now David and his men were sitting in the innermost parts of the cave. And the men of David said to him, Here is the day of which Yahweh said to you, Behold, I will give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it shall seem good to you. Then David arose and stealthily cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And afterward, David's heart struck him because he had cut off a corner of Saul's robe. He said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, to my master, Yahweh's anointed, to put out my hand against him, seeing he is Yahweh's anointed. So David persuaded his men with these words and did not permit them to attack Saul. And Saul rose up and left the cave and went on his way. Afterward, David also arose and went out of the cave and called after Saul, My Lord, the king! And when Saul looked behind him, David bowed with his face to the earth and paid homage. And David said to Saul, Why do you listen to the words of the men who say, Behold, David seeks your harm? Behold, this day your eyes have seen how how Yahweh gave you today into my hand in the cave. And some told me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not put out my hand against my Lord, for he is Yahweh's anointed. See, my father, see the corner of your robe in my hand? For by the fact that I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you, you may know and see that there is no wrong or treason in my hands. I have not sinned against you, though you hunt my life to take it. May Yahweh judge between me and you. May Yahweh avenge me against you, but my hand shall not be against you. As the Proverbs of the, of the ancient says, Out of the wicked comes wickedness, but my hand shall not be against you. After whom has the king of Israel come out? After whom do you pursue? After a dead dog? After a flea? May Yahweh therefore be judge and give sentence between me and you, and see to it and plead my cause and deliver me from your hand. We'll keep going just a little bit longer here. As soon as David had finished speaking these words to Saul, Saul said, Is this your voice, my son, David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. He said to David, You are more righteous than I, for you have repaid me good, whereas I have repaid you evil. And we'll stop there, and Saul's going to continue on for a little while. Wow. It's a, it's a, <laughs> I love, the, I love this, this story. It's a fantastic it's really story good. because... Not only does David spare Saul's life, mm-hmm. he is conscience stricken that he even cut cut, the, cut a corner of his robe off. Yeah, it's it, it's such a it's such there's, there's, that's why it's the middle of our it's the it's the middle of our diagram because we we see it's really the heart of this of, of these yeah. these two men going in different directions. Yeah, we see the the dichotomy is the, is just so is highlighted so prevalently here. Now, just by, by way of a, a, a little thing, when, when David cuts off the corner of Saul's robe, one of the commentaries I read, and I had never thought of this, um, that Saul was probably had like a robe on, like a, like a sport coat over his clothes, a robe over his regular clothes, and he had taken that robe off and set it off and then was going about his business. And in my mind, again, uh, reading it for so many years, I thought David was literally like, up close. Up close. No. Yeah. Not, and again, not that they were far away, but there was, you know, some, some, a little bit of separation there for the, the situation. Um, but again, this, the, way that, the way that David continually, continually refers to Saul as Yahweh's anointed. Oh, to his own men who are like, hey, God promised to give you the throne. You're the anointed one. God has promised to give your enemies into your hands. Here he is. And David continually, I, I, I haven't counted it up. I should have counted it up. How many times does David, the anointed one of Yahweh, refer to the one that Yahweh has rejected as the anointed, as the anointed one of Yahweh? Again, this 
really accentuates this whole idea that for David, God's rules mm -hmm. are the rules. Yeah. You know, the way God does things, not the way we do things. Right. Because even as men said, if y'all are still following along, and I hope you are, because we only have uh, five more, five, maybe ten more minutes here, but um, the men said to David, this is the day mm -hmm. the Lord has made. Sort of, right. sort of right. kind. This is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands. They're basically telling David, this, this has got to be mm -hmm. it. The guy is in the cave. He's relieving himself. Yeah. You can take him out now right. and the whole thing's over. But David doesn't do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so David lets God do what God is going to do. Yeah. And he holds back his hand from harming right. Saul. Right. Now, this is a, an, interesting, a, an interesting point here for our lives as subjects to government, governing authorities. Yeah. That, you know, there... There is indeed theological and salvific things here pointing us to Christ. But there's also, there is also a lesson. It's a, there's, there's application. There's application that Saul has been rejected by God. Saul is pursuing unrighteous and evil things in the eyes of God. And yet David continually says, I'm not going to kill him. I'm going. David humbles himself and pays homage to Saul. Right. He's going to call it, David's going to call himself a dead dog and a flea compared to Saul. If anything, it's it's the reverse in in the in the eternal in yeah. the eternal things. Sure, right? and we know it is. We know David is greater than Saul. Yeah, but David is going to humble himself before this unrighteous man serving in the the office of of king. And now, what does that what does that mean for you and for me? For for us living in 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 our day when. You know the the government is per, you know uh, pursuing and supporting so many things that now, are progressive, uh, progressive against the will of against God. Against the will of God. Uh, you know, however you want to term it in terms of modern political theory. I mean, theory, you but, cannot argue with Scripture that we should not be a part of abortion. Right. And now our tax dollars are paying for elective abortion mm -hmm. procedures because uh, of the current administration. Right. Uh, the current administration uh, is uh, is attacking marriage mm -hmm. uh, and the God made distinction between male and female. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is biblical stuff right. that is under attack. Right. Or even, you know, even the grants to the arts and, and how the arts are maybe not so much artistic anymore as just trying to be shocking. You know, there's the. Uh, the the famous example. I guess it was from the 90s. The, yeah, I know what the, you were, the, the, know cru what the crucifix in the jar. Um, uh, and you know that was I think that was a f that was funded by a, a humanities grant from the from the federal government, but you know so when when we talk about what do we what do we do as Christians and and under the under the authority of an unrighteous ruler, an unrighteous power and an authority, David, who's got even more claim on his rights, he's got even more claim on on this position. David gives him up. He sets him aside. He, he submits insofar as, right? right? Insofar as Saul is not going, you know. I mean, David is still running away from Saul. He is. He's yeah. still hiding from Saul. He's, right. He's still surviving, but he will not lash out mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. at Saul. Um, and so, I, you know, this is something for us to, to wrestle with right. in, in, in our day as, as Christians and, and just to putting ourselves under so much diff different authorities. And going back to Psalm 54, mm -hmm. uh, what should our prayer look like as we pray for the governing mm -hmm. authorities? What should our prayer look like as we pray for the President of the United States or for the leaders of the world who are not motivated by godly things, mm -hmm. uh, but who are motivated by worldly things? We are to, the Bible clearly says we are to pray for them. Yeah. Uh, but we are also to pray that evil mm -hmm. would not prevail. Yeah. Uh, and that is a legitimate prayer, even as we lift up the governing authorities, mm -hmm. that God would intervene and not let evil prevail and that he would have his way. Yeah. And you know that he does. Uh, if you really want a great um, story after story after story to illustrate this, you need to read the book of Daniel. Mm -hmm. uh, Daniel is a fantastic a reminder that God is the ultimate king. Yeah. So. And, and, and ruling, ruling over all of these things. And so, so we want to, uh, just to, I don't, 
We're we got we to gotta wrap, we gotta we gotta wrap, wrap this up. up. Yep. And so, um, so Saul says, you are more, sorry for my bad handwriting there. Saul says, you are more right. Oh, oh, oh David, uh, David Lois, spares. Lois is going to want Lois it. is going to want that. David spares Saul. Um, and so, so Saul is pursuing him. And instead of, you know, persecuting back or striking back, David is going to spare Saul. And he's going to do it again in uh, 1 Samuel 26. There's going to be a, a similar scene as well. But then, in the, especially here in First in First Samuel twenty four, Saul is going to say, "You are more righteous than me," uh, which is the uh, uh, this strange conf- confession from Saul, uh, admission from Saul, which is, uh, it, it it just it, it really magnifies his guilt. It does because he knows he knows, um, and and so that's where that's why it's here. And then Saul David is going to to grant a, a wish. He's going to make an oath. Um, because Saul is going to say, David, I know you're going to be king. You have every right to do what every you know, succeeding king gets to do, which is to wipe out the family of the previous dynasty. Please do not wipe out my family. And David says, I will not wipe out your family. Even, and that, even down to one person, and, right? And we can get to the rest of this maybe next week. Yeah. We can fill it out. But I, I do want to say that in the ancient world, it was standard operating procedure that when a king or a new um, Egyptian dynasty mm-hmm. uh, would come into power. They would literally erase the history. I kid you not. They would erase mm-hmm. every written memory of the former nation yep. from every um, as much as they could find. As much as they could find. Yep. If there was a steel, a steely, is it called St- steel? Steel. Is it steel? I, I think it's a steel or a steely. S T E L E. Yeah, <laughs> it's got an E at the end of it. But these stone obelisks mm-hmm. that had history recorded for them, they would even come in and rub that out mm-hmm. and then rewrite the history. Yeah. I mean, even in stone, they would wipe every memory from, um, from the, the history books. Yep. Uh, and they would also wipe out the progeny mm-hmm. of any of the, the former rulers. So yep. they would literally come in and kill all the wives you know, with the exception of, of maybe the ones that they, they have their eyes on, right. right? But they would kill the children because what they didn't want to have happen was for the progeny to grow up and come back and get, um, mm-hmm. get even. Yep. And there's a lot of stories in ancient history of they missed one son and that son would come back and... They and missed one Yeah. There are the true stories. The one son comes back yeah. and gets even. And so... Uh, David does not up the ante. He says mm-hmm. he's going to spare Saul's family. Yep. He's going to let him live. Yep. So, all right, Pastor Clayton, thank you very yeah, much. Thank you. Uh, great, great uh, study uh, in the differences between these two guys. Please join us next week at nine thirty. We'll continue our our journey through uh, the life of King David and and uh, how he responds and reacts to the situations of his life. Uh, reminder: uh, we do have an eleven o'clock service. It's not in-person worship today. It is a live stream only um, worship. Join us at 11 o'clock. We'd love to have you with us. Let's close with the blessing of the Lord. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us and remain with us now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Amen.